Okay, so uh, uh, this is basically we're halfway through our three-day event. A very interesting day that has uh, uh, started by dealing with uh, the connection between multiculturalism and consecrated life. And this is basically uh, the uh, outcome, the final destination of this uh, four-year-long journey that was started uh, thanks to uh, Professor Luca Pandolfi, uh, tenure professor of uh, cultural anthropology at the Higher Institute uh, of Missionary Catechesis and Spirituality. I will not go through his resume once again, but basically, I would like to summarize just very briefly uh, their achievements for those who have just joined us. So we have Professor Enrico Ottone, and a full professor of social and intercultural uh, pedagogy from the uh, Pontifical School of Educational Sciences from the Auxilium here in Rome. I would like to spend a couple of words at this point because we are now uh, plunged, as we have seen uh, this morning, into something that usually uh, does not apply to our students, in both men and women, and talking about the methodologies of uh, social sciences. We know that uh, priority is given to the speculative and demonstrative uh, dimension of science, and this is a great opportunity to uh, place social sciences as one of the two lungs, I would say, fundamental lungs. If we think about education and formation within our pontifical university and all related to the intercultural aspect, this is one lung. The other lung is biblical theological sciences. In the 1990s, we used to uh, talk a lot uh, about uh, uh, qualitative versus quantitative analysis in research. Today, while I was listening to uh, the uh, beautiful lectures that were provided by our, our speakers today, we can now see that there can be a beautiful dialogue that can be established between quantitative and qualitative research. Thanks also to the greater opportunities that are provided by uh, data uh, analysis and treatment methods, because the analysis of contents and the analysis of data, they require uh, different software, different applications, and this was possible and is possible uh, right now in this time and age. So really, you have uh, done a wonderful job. Many of our students perhaps would never have thought that that sentence, right, that opinion that was expressed in the focus group could become now the subject uh, uh, to uh, then lead to a rereading uh, of uh, the importance of passing from uh, multiculturalism to interculturalism. Please allow me to make one additional comment which I believe is important, that stems from a sentence that was shown in the slides earlier. And this also uh, crisscrosses with uh, my epistemological uh, background uh, as a clinical psychologist. Interculturality is, comes from the encounter, but the outcome cannot be predicted due to uh, the individual transformation and group transformation. And I believe that this uh, explicit uh, mention is very interesting because this refers to an important epistemological basis that has been neglected somehow, but that has evolved over time. The faults within the uh, cognitivistic approach and uh, post-rationalist constructivist uh, cognitivism more specifically, I would say that these foundations uh, that are being uh, laid down uh, could then lead to operational uh, actions, both uh, towards an integral human formation and also towards intercultural formation. Very well. 
at this point, I would like to move on to the first contribution. Uh, and they will be uh, then uh, provided to us uh, by uh, Professor Ottone. We are in the, the second part, basically, of uh, uh, this topic, Theology and Cultures Beyond the Question of Enculturation and Contextualization. Oh, no, no, sorry. Uh, my bad. It is um, multiculturality and formation in the pontifical universities and the formation of religious life and uh, intercultural competence under construction, qualitative analysis of critical incident narratives of a group of university students. That's the title. Uh, well, you will probably have to stop me at this point because I'm very passionate about this. Um, unlike the earlier contribution where I stopped a few minutes short of the time allotted to me, I will try to uh, speak slowly. I apologize with our foreign friends who are following us in a different language because as I was reading uh, my presentation I was thinking about the people who are uh, joining us uh, remotely I know that it must be very hard uh, following what we're saying unfortunately you know I apologize right from the very beginning for this reason very briefly, I will describe the context, the participants, the methodology, and I will try to devote as much time as possible to the results and conclusions. Okay, this project started before the research project that we presented this morning started, and this is something that I implemented with my students, uses this methodology that I would like to introduce to you. And then with Professor Pandolfi, we decided to include this also within this research project, the one that was described earlier. So you will see that many of our students belong to the institution that I work for, uh, the Pontifical School of Education Sciences uh, in Auxilium, a small department that's run by um, women religious. And there are many uh, women students who are both religious and uh, lay students. And then some students were involved in the third focus group and as you will see it was quite a, a cumbersome uh, kind of work on the part of participants because it involves not just an interview but also some kind of self-work so we asked for their support and allegiance we explained to them the methodology and then uh, uh, the lockdown kicked in so out of the 23 who joined uh, the only then six uh, individuals uh, uh, where uh, went until the end, basically, were involved until the end. And the others are both uh, lay and religion students of our uh, school. You see the breakdown uh, that refers to uh, continent of origin, then also the place where this challenging situation or critical incident that the students are talking about took place. There are several Italians, about uh, 30 uh, lay uh, students, girls, and then we have students coming from another 22 countries. In this slide, you can see the places where these uh, critical incidents have happened that we are going to analyze momentarily. Methodology, just a few words on this. It is based uh, on the analysis of written documents, uh, uh, basically uh, stories that the participants have decided to write, like an autobiographical story referring to a challenging event that they have experienced. And this is based on other methodologies and more specifically uh, research, uh, research projects that were conducted both in Italy and Canada. What is this tool here? Let us assume that right now I will ask you, okay, tell me uh, about a challenging situation, a situation that you have experienced in a multicultural context where you felt uh, let's say, challenged by somebody else uh, uh, who has a different culture or speaks a different language from your own, where you uh, felt ill at ease, or where you were surprised instead by the fact that an interchange was possible. So the interesting thing that I tried to do from the very beginning is to take not only uh, conflict or problem situations, but also positive situations that could have been experienced. And uh, those who told their stories, they uh, usually uh, told us stories that were challenging and kind of bad. Only three uh, people told us, uh, shared with us a story that was positive right from the very beginning. So let us imagine a situation that we have experienced 
it takes a while for to convince someone to tell this story. And the first, uh, let's say, uh, story is written down and notes are taken. And then uh, this is discussed uh, with a colleague, a peer, basically. And then this story is written down and is forwarded to me. And I acted as facilitator. And there was somebody else who helped me later on. And then we ask questions based on these stories. So we include questions in the text. and. The person keeps elaborating on the story and uh, fine-tuning the text until he or she uh, complies with the criteria. The criteria are describing what context this situation happened, who uh, were the people involved, what happened in that specific episode, one single episode possibly. And then there are very interesting questions. So uh, what did you think immediately when this happened? What were your feelings? What did you feel? What kind of emotions did you feel? What did you do? How did you act? What meaning this event had to you? And what do you think this event uh, could mean to the other person, to your counterpart? Then the next step, at least the three and four steps of change and exchange of this text was the question, in your opinion, what competencies uh, have you used in that situation? And, uh, Basically, in these forms, well, students uh, listed many competencies. Uh, Francesca is here uh, with us, and she helped me analyze this work because I asked myself at some point, well, if I'm the only one who does this kind of research, am I really sure that my classification truly uh, is truly objective? So I asked Francesca to help me and reread uh, uh, all these uh, categories and change them. Uh, and it was a very important work we carried out together. The last question was, of these competencies, so where have you developed these competencies? This is a question, too, that has a, an impact uh, on formation. The software we used, and uh, this was uh, handed over to me by those who came before me, I try to learn. And uh, uh, these uh, uh, forms are, are not really that huge of a corpus when it comes to the number of words, it one to two pages stops for each person, so it's 80 pages. So 842 codes emerged from this. Those, this means that these texts were very rich. I analyzed them based on these questions that I will not go through from beginning to end right now. I mean, we will go through them one by one. I would like to linger on C, D, and E. What emotions, sorry, B, bravo. What did you think, right? And what had your emotions and your actions? So your thoughts, your emotions, and actions. Professor De Rio has already gave us a foretaste of this. We're already talking about competencies. Competencies include cognitive aspects, affective and motivational aspects, and also the aspects that are related to the will, the willfulness, the intentionality that was already highlighted. What are the situations that they shared with them? Well, this uh, uh, overview here is quite poor and limited and also written with very tiny and small print. But basically, these 75 situations, uh, how can we, can I organize them? And I remember a conversation I had with Professor Pandolfi to ask him if he could help me to classify these different elements. And we found, or at least we came up with the idea of uh, organizing all this around uh, social behaviors and social attitudes. So we have communication, social behaviors, and social attitudes. But then communication, we had to kind of uh, disregard this because it was so powerful. What has emerged uh, remarkably, this is nothing new here, is uh, language difficulties with 12 forms that mention this. And then in order to analyze this, I had to uh, see what are the elements of nonverbal communications that uh, people have been telling us about. It might help us classify this. Uh, so we have uh, uh, kinetics, uh, proxemics, uh, uh, everything that's related to how difficult it is to understand each other when it comes to the use of space, the tone of your voice, uh, our gestures, uh, and uh, the joking way uh, in which we interact and which can cause discomfort in the other. From the standpoint of social uh, behavior, something that I would like to focus 
your attention on is the respect or compliance with rules and norms, both in communities of consecrated life, but also if we think about uh, relationships within other contexts, then different education styles, and then difficulty in relating with, with peers or colleagues and superiors, being reproached, right? This is very interesting. From the standpoint of social attitudes, we have uh, stereotypes and biases, and some forms are truly uh, very, very tough to read and uh, to refer to uh, a great suffering that these people had and these women have been bold enough to share their stories. An example of, the, of these codes, I would like to refer to the central part of compliance with rules and, uh, and standards or norms. During catechesis, uh, uh, a woman religious, uh, they had a hard time with a child. They told the mother that uh, there were some difficulties after a few warnings, and they kind of worded this quite powerfully. And uh, the mother reacted by kissing uh, the son, the little boy. And uh, the sister said, I got angry. I was annoyed by this behavior because I was uh, expecting the mother to reproach, to scold her child. And in the form, she actually uh, talks about the rage she felt uh, uh, towards that mother who, from her standpoint, uh, reacted in the wrong way. And now, compared to assumption, let's now uh, then talk about uh, the parts that, come, that came later. I would like to disregard this because we have already mentioned this uh, in a way earlier. What are the things that we're looking for in our form? Are they in either in A, B, or C? So are, is this considered as a problem, something that has not been managed, or are we able to get all the way to interculturalism? Let's see this tangibly. Immediate thoughts. One question was, in this situation, what did you think immediately, right there and then? And when, with, with the help of Francesca, when we uh, organized uh, all this in the three categories, uh, thoughts about myself, uh, thoughts about the other and thoughts about the situation. And you can l look at the thoughts about the other. The other sees reality and behaves in a different way, right? That's uh, basically an acknowledgement. He is biased against me. He or she uh, has something against me. And this is an immediate thought. It does not necessarily lead to action. He or she does not understand that what I'm saying is right. Right, So you see that there is a difficulty in uh, basically putting ourselves in other people's shoes. Uh, the other person is wrong, is uh, aloof. Uh, in the case of this uh, sister who uh, was thinking about the mother, well, she's wrong. She should not be uh, giving a kiss to her child. Regarding instead the movement towards interculture, okay, we're, we're far away from this. So these are thoughts about myself. Uh, I don't understand why he's, he or she's telling me this, or how, or why he or she behaves in this way. So you're not judging uh, others. I'm still referring to myself, and I'm wondering about my way of perceiving that situation. I'm not able to handle this situation. So feeling incapable, being aware, uh, or perhaps that I'm uh, acting based on a stereotype of being wrong, not knowing what to expect. Then instead, uh, the thoughts about the situation. So the awareness that other factors come into play. And here, we're moving more towards interculture with an awareness that's also more critical regarding cultural identity and relationship. Well, we're running out of time, so I will not linger on this. I would like to move, move on to this slide that I really like. I like this because it tells me as a, a formator and as a, a professor, as a teacher, we have to take care of them. These students who uh, arrive in Italy for the first time, these are students who live in Italy or religious communities that are based in Italy. And you can see from the color here, I, I, I felt ill at ease. I, I felt bad, you see. Uh, the feelings are suffering, uh, malaise, fear. The quoted 19, 19 times rage, anxiety, agitation, embarrassment, uh, shame, humiliation, sense of powerlessness. I felt excluded, uh, feeling troubled, uh, um, baffled, surprised. Uh, I was completely flabbergasted. You know, these were the expressions that were used. Quite often in the forums, you can see that 
there are more than 75, emotions are mentioned many, many times, especially in some forms by some people who really uh, started thinking about their own reactions and feelings in that situation that they have experienced re-evoking this. Of course, they did not immediately describe all this right after the situation happened. So there's also an interpretation on their part since some time has elapsed. And then in some forms, in the same form, you see, we have the passage of transition. I excluded this because of lack of time, but there was a case of a student who went from negative emotions into a specific action. She moved on to positive emotions for having been able to overcome that situation. This software is very beautiful, really. I would like to thank whoever showed me this software because it's so effective. And really, th this deserves to be dealt into. It's a automatically generated map that shows the relationship between I ch chose to place the uh, national, uh, sorry, the n negative emotions and the thoughts of the other. And we can see that the thoughts about the other are connected to emotions. So I'm wondering at this point, what comes first, thoughts or emotions? Who knows? <laughs> Maybe I cannot give the answer to this question, but it might be interesting to investigate this and try to reply to these questions in the forums, because in the story, sometimes they uh, tell us about thoughts first and then the emotions, sometimes the other way around. However, we have to take into account of these emotions as formations. We not, cannot get to the situation that was uh, uh, shared with me in one of these forums. Uh, uh, director, she said, before I, she left after four or five years, she said that she had experienced that specific situation in the community. So these negative emotions have lingered, have simmered for four or five years without being addressed and have led to a massive waste of energy. And this is linked, the, the, the most cumbersome or tough forms, were related to uh, situations of, of life in common, mostly. Regarding actions, the level of interchange. I try to uh, really challenge uh, the assumption that Father Luca has uh, uh, shared with us at the beginning of this project. Uh, so absent or problematic interchange is related to actions that refer to the static character of behavior. I've uh, was centered on myself. I did not realize this immediately. I stopped participating. I passed judgment on something. I tried to defend myself. I have ignored. I moved away. For a week or just superficial interchange at the center, you see statements that refer to competencies that can be identified, I believe, as basic competencies, communication skills, relational skills, uh, human skills in a way, which are the foundation in order to get to the third level. And here I had major doubts, and I still have some doubts, regarding that part that you see highlighted uh, with a very thick line here that refers to explaining. So while I was analyzing this, I realized that many times the, word, the verb explained was used. I explained, I asked someone to explain to me, I've looked for information, I received an explanation. And so I really went to quantify and see how many times uh, this verb was used and where it was used. I decided to uh, place this in the section that is closer to interculture, because I believe this is an important work that we have to learn to do uh, of critical interpretation. We have to realize that explaining is always interpreting in a way. We're always dealing with interpretations of the other or about the other. So this aspect too, on the one hand, can be included in the weak uh, portion of interculturality, explaining if one plus one equals two, which is impossible. Instead, if explaining it means trying to understand in depth, then at that point it becomes uh, an intercultural activity. And if we go in and count here uh, numbers, I have uh, decided to try, or at least I created an interchange you cannot see the figures here probably, but are quite low because I, I try to uh, basically uh, promote interchange. Uh, 
well, interculture is not something, an experience that is shared too much as a living experience. This is what came out of these forms. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, but it doesn't come out of these forms that I have analyzed. An example of a form that showed to me the transition from uh, let's say a before and after and then when the after we see that a change happened since that moment on I decided uh, to speak only when it was necessary I spent time uh, being silent and dead I was feeling rejected I did not want to live this experience uh, because I, that made me feel very bad and after a number of actions uh, that the student uh, decided to undertake and this was an apprenticeship in a school basically uh, she was like a, a teacher's assistant, she was training. She said, I decided uh, to face this difficulty, uh, talking with X, to help her understand my difficulties. And I spoke with a, an open and truthful heart. If I still have a few minutes left, may I? I would like to say something about the notion of intercultural competencies or intercultural competencies or competence? Well, I would rather talk about competencies or skills to live interculturalism and not really talk about one single skill or competence. Why? Because when I was thinking about this concept, I believe that the notion of system is interesting. I really was not bold enough to write this down. Uh, I didn't find the courage to do that because I still have to think about this. But indeed, intercultural competencies can be seen within us as a system of competencies that interact with each other, as a set that is structured, that is of a human relationship, uh, so, sorry, basic human and relational uh, skills that intersect with more specific skills and competencies, which are given by our knowledge and to us in academia, the importance of having courses, uh, intercultural pedagogy and cultural anthropology in all universities, even universities do not, that do not specifically focus on these specific subjects. And then we also have to work on uh, abilities, on skills. So this was a, a workshop. We've been working on this. And in the analysis of what the students are asking for, not just students, but also members of consecrated life, we see that this is also something that's required, this aspect as well. I've already mentioned this. This refers to uh, then setting in motion, integrating, coordinating, and making, uh, let's say, emotional and other skills so, so that it can be put to work. So if we think about competencies and skills as uh, basic skills on the one hand, and on the other hand, advanced skills, which in my view, in line with what Milena Santerini will say probably on Friday, these pertain to the interpretation of our own culture and other people's culture and find the point of contact and common meanings and shared horizons. And this is in line with the definition of competence. So regarding competencies, and here we went and looked for not only uh, the declared competencies, but the ones that we thought we could see, right? from those forms that describe situations, uh, real life situations. So we have basic communication skills. There are 64, you see. These were mentioned 64 times. So working on this is already in a way, uh, a way for us to work on interculturalism. Being able to communicate using different languages, observing, reflecting, without being uh, stopping at the first intuition, being able to handle emotions, uh, being able to manage uh, conflicts and biases, uh, decentralization, being able to assess one's own culture and other people's culture, and therefore the, therefore the awareness of multiplicity, and then finding shared horizons. And you, as you can see, here, what I was saying earlier is being proved. Finding uh, shared horizons is something that's very hard to do. It's something that emerges uh, very rarely from these uh, stories that were told. Uh, the slide here is stuck. Okay, alrighty. It's working now, thank you. So here, one example of exchange of interpretations regarding the color of the skin. And I would like to understand only the final portion. I told you uh, what my views are. You tell me what your views are. Sharing led us to wonder what criterion uh, should be used to define the beauty of an individual, right? So here 
we see this uh, interchange that has occurred. How have you developed these competencies uh, in your job, in a con in community of consecrated life, in a university context, not just in theory, but in practice? Here we have no time. But if we had some time, we have all the analytical part of academic communities, which is very, very interesting. And then uh, real life uh, experiences, also in missions and stuff like that. We should never think that these uh, competencies and skills are acquired once and for all, not at all. The uh, competencies that I am applying are the, the uh, result of time that has gone by in my experience. And this has been very useful in this form. This individual said, if I hadn't done this kind of work and I haven't uh, written these things down, I wouldn't have realized what I have experienced actually, and I could not have focused on this in the way I did. I would like to finish mentioning challenges. The challenges uh, that are shown by this work are, first of all, promoting uh, re a reflection and awareness. Some students told me, well, if I hadn't uh, done this kind of work, and we have done this uh, in the master's degree course, I would never have realized the richness that I have experienced uh, living next to uh, my peers, uh, the other fellow students. And someone said, this is something that you should do in the first year. In the focus groups involving uh, both faculty members and students, they were saying in the beginning, right from the very beginning, people should be made aware of the fact that this being a multicultural academic community allows us to develop competencies that can become important for the mission, but also for a, a, a job, a professional, let's say, career, lay students would say. So we have to make people realize that we need to engage in lifelong learning, because once you learn the skills, it becomes, has to become a habit, something that becomes part of me and that I always uh, implement providing uh, critical competencies, uh, working in these workshops, and then we see a recurring word here in the analysis that I cannot present to you, the, the word spaces, environments. And since I'm here at the Urbaniana, I would like to, uh, if I may, uh, well, I'm speaking about an institution, however, this is a nice thing that I would like to say. Students emphasize in a very positive way uh, a space that you have somewhere where people eat together because they're saying that that becomes a, a space for informal exchanges and also for development of intercultural competencies. I would say that this is all. And uh, this afternoon, in uh, our workshop, we will have the opportunity also uh, to have a practical experience. We will see how many we are. We will organize this depending on uh, the number of participants. OK, thank you. That's it. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Ottone, for focusing on what we said in the report in the first uh, part of the morning session about the critical incidence of this qualitative analysis. It's very interesting also how this uh, specification about competence on question number four is uh, one of the central nucleo, nuclei for the change of the new learning concerning the person uh, who is our interlocutor in the moment. That's what we can call a metacognition. That is the opportunity to think of our own thought, which is a capability that can certainly be acquired for intercultural uh, uh, formation. And I give the floor to Professor Luca Pandolfi with his uh, report, uh, his report, uh, which is also uh, another focus forming in multicultural and forming to intercultural challenges uh, to meet uh, any necessary transformation. Thank you. I also ask. Uh, you to show the slides. So a premise, uh, this is like a final uh, 
paper uh, about uh, the research I've been carrying out in this uh, in these four years. Uh, so I have uh, an important task now to make a synthesis and partial interpretation of a work in progress uh, and say a few uh, summarizing, summarizing words about what we listened to yesterday and today. So the first thing, this is a conclusion that does not to want to conclude anything. First of all, because we still have uh, today afternoon and tomorrow morning, and today we'll uh, listen uh, from uh, a format or something specific about the context of consider life and their experiences. And so um, the reading of reality continues. And we'll have also workshops uh, that uh, want to assimilate uh, some uh, uh, parts of our, our work that we lived in these four years in our research or that have been lived in the religious world as a way to face and accompany and manage multiculture for many years. And also it is not conclusive because we are still working on it. In fact, we were all researchers, not full-time researchers. That's important. No, we were all researchers very committed in other activities of research, and uh, nearly all of us uh, with activities of teaching and uh, coordination of uh, faculties, institutes, uh, so with the Professor Tone, she talked about the night uh, work uh, uh, in which we, we were uh, comparing our ideas. So these uh, four uh, years uh, work was marked at different levels by the pandemic, uh, but also marked by the fact that uh, all of us, uh, we are people well inserted in teaching formation and study and uh, academic management uh, or scientific, uh, at the scientific level. And we had also this research activity, and that's not trivial. Because in other contexts, uh, people um, have a full immersion for two or three years, uh, they have funds, uh, and they uh, work on what uh, uh, on specific things. So, so you can imagine <coughs> the first two years went to the various Italian regions, and it was always in the spare time without uh, any uh, um, without uh, interrupting our ordinary activities. Uh, so this uh, made us have many contacts with the scientific team, and we have so many data, and they're so rich. Uh, every time we find new elements of research that we are still uh, working upon, we, um, so it is a work in progress. Uh, so also in view of the future publication, which will be the, uh, proceedings uh, of the Congress, but also about our research. Professor Di Cenzi and Professor Tone said we still have to finish the comparative analysis between the part of qualitative research and the part of quantitative research uh, with the famous uh, questionnaire in nine languages. So a conclusion that does not want to conclude. Another aspect concerns the interpretation, starting from the perspective of socio-anthropological studies and the analysis of cultural processes in my discipline, in my subject. So I analyzed the data that emerged and the whole work that I've been carrying out since the beginning, which is typical of cultural anthropology, called the participation observation. So it is, uh, and this uh, takes on some ethnographic features. So participating observation does not only mean that I was immersed in this process, but during this immersion, I uh, signed up elements that came up and that uh, then sedimented and were enriched with time and understood more and more and uh, upon accompanying the stages of the research. So we'll share with you this uh, reading, this indication starting from everything that we saw together. So that's the first contribution. Then we'll eventually make a scientific report with the, which will be translated uh, into English uh, 
so it will be used uh, on a global level, usable on a global level. So some ethnographic notes, uh, so consi consider these uh, provocations, as I call you, to react, uh, to uh, give uh, feedback. So since the beginning in universities and in uh, communities of uh, concert life, uh, we had uh, felt a great resistance. So there are also statistical uh, statistics say that uh, if a questionnaire is distributed to 1,000 is uh, filled by 100, that's already good, good outcome. But considering the experience of those who preceded us in the US, uh, this contact took place uh, trying to personally call the person responsible of universities and communities. And it was a contact that involved uh, the um, Organs of Concerted Life for Men and Women. It was a contact that uh, involved the teachers for making the research, uh, the rectors, uh, the principals, uh, the professors, uh, the formators, uh, the uh, local um, and uh, major and superior, uh, superior general men, for men and women. And then uh, uh, the DEMEX includes uh, participation on one uh, other basis. Uh, you know, the research is not something that only a group of researchers do in uh, one reality, but you do by a group of researchers with a uh, reality. This with means that there is a part of negotiation, a part of common decision, a part of accepting the research, but as protagonist. So we, it is not just that we just open your door, you do what you have to do, and you go away. No, but there is a participation. So we observed, I have always been the research scientific coordinator, but Professor Longitano was the director of the institute, so, so he uh, worked on the contacts. And we often found a wall in front of us. Uh, we met a wall. So in quantitative terms, uh, sometimes it was a meeting, 36 people who look you in silence. Uh, you ask something, they uh, answer nothing, and you go away with their silence. So uh, even uh, the, uh, it is even bad education. I, I ask you something, at least uh, give uh, a reply. No, they looked at you in, in, in silence, uh, and uh, that was it. So universities and congregation often had uh, this uh, unrest, uh, this malaise, like, well, are you coming here to check us, to control us? So in our clerical, religious, Catholic world, this is a contest where those who look from outside, if this something comes from a superior, it's OK. Otherwise, I don't care. So it's a hierarchical-oriented attitude that, is, that cannot be evaluated positively, because a superior comes to evaluate me. So either you are a superior who imposes something to me, otherwise, I don't uh, react. And something that cannot uh, come from the uh, grassroots, the fact that you ask people, you know, it is like a political choice because uh, some words uh, re really resound. Certe narrazioni si aprono e, e quindi vogliamo aprire lo spazio a che la gente possa dire quello che sta vivendo. Eh, eh. So a, a low collaboration and a, a, a very tiring collaboration. So also statistically, it, it, it was, that was relevant. But also we had other positive reactions. Many congregations uh, said, oh, we have been working on this for a long time, especially the missionary congregations uh, that have uh, the, uh, for which impact with the intercultural is in their uh, DNA. They said, we are working on this. Uh, so at the beginning, the figures you saw, it is not that we contacted three, 13 realities, no, 300 realities, but 13 or 14 of them told us, uh, oh, how good, uh, that's an excellent occasion. It's excellent because uh, with three meetings, uh, you, we can uh, follow 
uh, we can give a continuation to your uh, uh, provocation. So more or less, uh, some more, some less, but uh, many of them have were pleased to be involved also from a scientific point of view on this issue of multiculturality, which is a fact that is sometimes a source of concern. So I stigmatize the negative part because it is physiological, but also it says something about a cultural process on which we should reflect especially because we talk about synodality, but we don't uh, want it. Then, teachers' resistance to uh, comparison, peer-to-peer, uh, uh, -peer, etc. So on the basis of the students and teachers, there is a sedimentary experience of multiculturality with a sporadic attempt of interculture. But with teachers, uh, and that was with students, with teachers, uh, I understand because as teacher, if they ask me, let us have three meetings next week, uh, they say, no, I already have hundreds of meetings. So you can understand it. In fact, uh, no group of teachers accepted the focus group of no university. Only two accepted uh, with alternate presence uh, and uh, only one in uh, another occasion. Otherwise, they consider it a waste of time. So the uh, part of the formators, which is neurologic and strategic in what happens in uh, formation. You know, there were a few interviews to, to the formators. They said, no, I prefer not to say anything. And I, I summarized this that, uh, with et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that uh, some students eventually reply to a question, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they deserve, uh, in that case, the maximum of vote, you know, a good A. So low operational uh, uh, availability, but also in terms of content. And that comes out, uh, yeah, OK, multiculturalism is our problem, but intercultural is not our problem. And, uh, uh, and then uh, another interesting uh, uh, problem this cognitive approach but also intellectual uh, cere <laughs> cerebral approach with the deductive idea i say something a person understands it and makes it operational this deductive uh, uh, approach uh, from a teaching and a formative point of view is very much present in our formative structures both religious and uh, university so that is when I say things, uh, people uh, uh, bring them into a behavior, into a, 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 an acceptance, and then that is turns into behavior. We know that pedagogically this doesn't work. We uh, have always known this, uh, but uh, much formation remains uh, deductive based. Uh, and, uh, uh, unfortunately. So one of the things that we, that we observed when we involved people talking, they said, oh, we already talked about this. Uh, yeah, on interculture, two years ago we had a meeting. Now we are doing another, we are dealing with another subject. So they leave interculture, not something that they have to verify each year, but something, yeah, we already did it. Like today we can say, oh, we already had a meeting on these. So for the next 10 years, uh, we can uh, uh, close the issue of interculture and not uh, make uh, anything about it. Second ethnographic note, the, bay, the grassroots was much more uh, reactive. Already introduced the outcome, three focus group, a very interesting experience, both for formators, the facilitators of the focus group, and also for the basis of the communities of concerted life and the students. It was an interesting experience with a strange game, where in the qualitative stage, the women's communities were resistant to welcome a group of formators while the men's community were very open to welcome a group of facilitators. In the quantitative stage, it is the other way around. As Professor De Cenci said, 
have to understand uh, why men uh, do less online and women do more online. But uh, our university has 20% uh, of women and 80% of men. So if it were true that they told me about the Urbaniana, it would be, uh, that would say that most of our students uh, did not interact. The Auxilium could say the, the opposite, because they are mainly women. So we should compare that datum with the, with the concrete situation. But in the quantitative stage, also in terms of contacts, the USMI, for example, the contact at 380 houses, and 30 of them responded. Some uh, responded, yes, we'd like to be involved, and others said, no, we'd like, but we are monocultural, so no point. Uh, the men's uh, had 480 requests and zero responses, so the, the men did not respond to anything. So in the dynamic of participation, it seems uh, that uh, the word of Women's Catholic uh, uh, consecrated the reality uh, is more uh, active and reactive. Another uh, notice that the cognitive uh, no notes, uh, the cognitive problems, uh, the, the difference uh, between multicultural and intercultural is not so clear. We have to cross interpretation data because when Professor Chess said, if we ask what is the difference between multicultural and intercultural, giving the two definitions, 72 or 74 uh, percent of people would respond uh, the, uh, correctly, the one that uh, provides also for the mutual transformation. But if we ask uh, a practical example like uh, books, uh, so all those elements of the formation to consecrate the life also in university that uh, present in the formative supply at least a co-presence of a cultural proposals, they say no, 75%, they say no, uh, everything is zero-centered here, almost always a book, uh, books are monolinguistic, etc. Then uh, to the question, how do we uh, assess your multicultural reality, they say, oh, it is very multicultural. No, they, they say it is very multicultural. So I wonder if it is very multicultural, when we ask you concrete examples uh, and they are all non-multicultural, so how do you explain uh, this assessment? Uh, it is maybe because uh, for a reason, at least I have an assumption, I have a hypo hypothesis. <laughs> <clears throat> then how can we transform this reality? So both for Matos and for me say, yes, multicultural would be beautiful, but uh, how can we shift to it? Uh, how can we make the passage? Very few people uh, can make any, any, uh, can have the tools, have the tools or desire to have the tools. So something we know that there are some discourses uh, but not uh, operational projects. So there is even a lexical uh, uh, lack of uh, words referring to concrete projects, both, both uh, in the questionnaire and the focus group, uh, while there is abundance of words uh, that refer to values. And uh, this is the problem. Uh, so going back to the initial hypothesis, uh, I think the word Exchange works for multicultural or intercultural, but only in the software. But the word change doesn't. The two words are lexically close to each other. And this makes us reflect, because if we dialogue, if we give and receive with attention to the direction of giving and receiving, it is OK. But if we talk about transforming ourselves, contaminating ourselves, or even change, then there is fear, instability, danger, and loss. So the question is, uh, what do you mean by cultural identity? What do you mean by your culture? Because uh, this is one of the cognitive notes that uh, are very clear in the discipline. But in the 
people and even informators, it, it is not so clear. So what the idea of culture, like I, I'm afraid of losing my cultural identity, how do you leave your identity, your cultural identity? When you say, oh yeah, but I believe that, uh, yeah, I can uh, uh, exchange something, but I leave it with the fear that I can cont get contaminated. How do you think you're pure? Oh, what is it about? So here we find out that in the cross analysis of discourses and statistical data, what comes out is an idea where our own culture, as well as other people's culture, is intended in essentialist terms. So it is something that is there. It is there. We, we have the idea of giving and receiving, the idea of possession of a material idea. The idea of contamination is a, uh, is a flu fluid idea, while the idea of having or losing or acquiring uh, mutual enrichment, uh, this capitalist idea of uh, pieces that come and go. So there is uh, either an uh, uh, in, innate culture where people are their culture, they are the culture, innatism, or that uh, culture is something that is there and we talk about it. We make a dialogue, we share, we uh, share notions, uh, and we accumulate uh, know-how. And this is the sentence of UNESCO that concluded, uh, used to, it just to conclude, intercultural is not that, that I know your culture and you know my culture, but it is that we enter into a deep, uh, stable, and serious relationship uh, no, of non-fear, uh, where uh, of understanding of myself and uh, and understanding you, and also understand the space and time where we live, uh, hence the open to intercultural uh, in the rich uh, perspective. So we don't have imagine, to imagine this on the day of the issues of people or that I have to share my Italian culture in the dialogue on racism. Uh, they say, oh, they must become like us Italians, uh, uh, that we don't pay taxes, etc. Or we are not Italians because uh, we eat pasta. So I have a friend from Congo who says, every time that they have an intercultural lunch, I do nothing. I don't give any contribution because they, they ask me, the Indonesian bring Indonesian food. Indians bring Indian food. Uh, Albanese bring Albanian food. The Italians bring Italian food. And the Africans are asked to bring African food. But we are a continent. Why don't they ask to bring Nigerian food or from my state of Nigeria? So this idea of boxes, the idea that you know notions, that they can have a notion of the culture of the other person and make an exchange, a cerebral intellectual exchange based on content. But the idea is that of transforming each other. Another thing that uh, makes us think is uh, the gap between formators and formees. This can be self-critical and disturbing, but there is a generational gap between uh, uh, formators and formees. But what we observe uh, is that in uh, formees, both uh, for the position as uh, people who live in the multimedia uh, context, uh, Etc. And because uh, they already had uh, experience so many different uh, parts of the world, very often those who come here uh, come from a rural to an urban context, and they moved to another state, and then they came to Europe, from then they came to Italy. So they already crossed many worlds. So there are people who have uh, skills uh, or have uh, malaise, but they have uh, it in their uh, process of understanding of themselves and the world. While the teachers are more monocultural and incapable of thinking that the subject uh, is one way of intending that subject in the world. Uh, very often, they, like I teach uh, psychology, and I teach one psychology, I, or teach a theology, no, you teach a theology, a contextual theology. No, context of theology are those of others, uh, not my own. No, that includes your own. Or I teach uh, human sciences. 
the human sciences. So we say to ourselves uh, the reality is plural, but uh, we perceive as the social science uh, that reads uh, the reality of uh, Europeans uh, uh, because we understood how to read the whole reality of the world. And uh, the others or the others are ethnic. For philosophy, I teach uh, philosophical anthropology. No, you teach a kind of uh, philosophy anthropology. No, you teach a history of philosophy of a certain part of the world. It was very interesting to make a comparison with the former uh, principal of uh, Auxilium, a Korean uh, professor. In the focus group, she said, uh, when I was in Korea, I studied uh, the pedagogists uh, from all over the world, uh, those from China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, India, military schools of pedagogy. And for us, it was very important to study the European pedagogy, uh, the Montessori, the, the uh, pedagogy of the uh, based on uh, psychology that in Europe uh, in the last three centuries uh, created uh, the European thought. It was a great resource for me. And then I came here, I inserted, uh, it was hard, but uh, very much integrated, very well integrated, uh, and uh, she uh, speaks very well Italian. But when I came to this Faculty of Science of Education, they only spoke about European things. They didn't know anything about the rest of the world. And, uh, and they, they thought that pedagogy and psychopedagogy was born in Europe, uh, and it had, uh, borders all over the world coming from Europe. But I had studied the millennium of psychopedagogy developed in the last four centuries in other countries, in other continents. So why in Europe you never talk about this? And I said, but you, you were the, uh, uh, rec the president of this institute. Uh, well, the other people uh, said, OK, no, it's OK like that. And besides uh, the generational gap, uh, teachers very close in their subject, thinking that it is not contextual, but the discipline and teachers very close in their monoculture, unlike uh, the students who know their culture uh, and they're sometimes afraid to lose it, but they used to uh, live in multiculturality. So the other question was, what they do with the multicultural the foreign teachers? Because one of the assumptions uh, on the ground in our research is that in our case uh, the Pontifical University and in the case of uh, formation to consider life, uh, formators uh, have a multicultural origin. So I wondered what did they do? These teachers uh, coming from Asia, Africa or Americas, uh, what did they do with their background when, when they do uh, formation in our context? What perception do they have? Uh, why what comes out is the multiculturality of students and for me it's and the one of teachers does not appear maybe looking at them geographically they come from different parts of the world so where is the difference uh, what uh, do they do so sister chang uh, made this intervention but uh, how about the others uh, so it is not that uh, not to be accepted in a concept of european mainstream they hide it maybe they denied it maybe they think that their background uh, had uh, uh, was before it was like that and now they have a different one but it would be interesting to know it in fact uh, the people who are uh, in formation they have a memory of their uh, multicultural formation much more than the formators they analyze it sometimes with poor tools this multiculturality and uh, in fact uh, the understanding with the multicultural is not always so clear but uh, sometimes uh, they present a human and cultural competence, which is very interesting and brings them to us for information. So very often we had a request uh, for formation, which was very serious. Uh, so we need these uh, because they lived on their skin. Uh, they didn't say, uh, no, we have nothing to do with the interculture. No, they say that our formation has to work with interculture, work on interculture. Now, possible uh, for pathways of formation. I think one important thing is not uh, to make of this reflection just a subject we dealt with, and uh, let's uh, meet next time. Evangelii Gaudium says that, that uh, faculties must have uh, a clear multidisciplinary 
awareness, uh, they must have a, a characteristic, but a uh, good and important part in their uh, formative proposal must welcome uh, different uh, subjects and they must create a dialogue between teachers of different disciplines within uh, the university. Our High Institute of uh, uh, is doing this for 30 years, so maybe we need working groups with an external formator with the teachers' teachers uh, and the teachers' students. So they ask uh, workshops uh, with teachers and the uh, workshops uh, teachers' uh, students uh, on these uh, issues uh, that we uh, dealt with, in which we dealt with lights and shadows and uh, the hardships and uh, richness. Second, uh, this reflection should get out of the, an episodic attitude. So we need a competence that is part of the contemporary world. The so Evangelic Guardian proposes this as a must, a need in academic formation, in university formation. So maybe a, a, a self-evaluation uh, module so we could use it with some elements where the uh, teacher, the formator, wanders at least once a year. When I pre present my syllabus, uh, in the case of students, uh, or when uh, I am a formator, consent in life, and um, do my plan of formation on a congregational level, uh, the question is, do, uh, like an examination of consciousness, am I careful to a plurilinguistic and pluricultural dimension? So the advice, uh, in the advice of the students, uh, do I pay attention that uh, texts uh, and han handbooks uh, are contextual? Because uh, many students uh, like the fact that in Europe, in Italy, they're given a proposal of formation with a, a Eurocentric uh, proposal. That's not a problem because they said, okay, we came here to notice. So as uh, the daughter of Anna Zell would say, we don't want to become Africans or Asians uh, because we are European. But uh, to, to give room, uh, yes, this is another issue. So they're very happy to come here and know our heritage. But the difficulty is, is when it is only European and when the European heritage is not perceived as European but as universal. And that's a uh, delirium, really. Uh, the other thing is congregational or intercongregational workshops uh, where you can uh, elaborate uh, in a multicultural context uh, not only formation but also the charism. So in the world, uh, you know, charism is a very hard work because the charism has a story, has a cultural identity historically placed. So the idea of touching the charism for an intercultural reading of the charism means uh, like uh, uh, shaking not uh, the, the canopy, but the uh, roots of the tree. And that, that's uh, uh, faced with fear. So I threatened the professor Paluzzi, uh, not to interrupt me, because I'm still his uh, uh, director, so until January. So I think that beyond this, uh, there is a not, uh, this uh, observation goes out of the research, uh, but I have the impression that beyond much study, much bibliography, many quoted the, the ascension of Pandolfi. No, it is not by Pandolfi. Thank you. It is only a synthesis taken from the bibliography, from a work on the ground, from a scientific work which was published in the last 30 or 40 years. Everything that we listen to and we listen to tomorrow says us that it has ancient roots. I didn't define it as intercultural. Intercultural formally can be distinguished from the dimension of multicultural because one defines a co-presence and the other in an, an interlocution. It is plurisubjective. It is a product of intersubjectivity. But I have the impression that despite the fact that this is clear in the daily perception and in the 
with so much uh, scientific approach, we have uh, an idea, an essentialist idea, a static idea of a cultural identity. So our idea of identity, we, uh, you know, what we should accept, uh, as an, uh, yesterday Zavaroni said, every time we talk about ethnicity, an anthropologist dies. So every time I hear, no, but it is uh, our identity here and, and there. Identity is a speech, it is not a reality, it is a discourse. I know it is disturbing, but when we talk about identity, we talk about it, but it doesn't exist. Because the word identity, cultural identity, especially if we talk about cultural identity, this psychologically doesn't exist. It is a self-perception. It is not the self, because our cultural self, our physiological self, our body, our relations are continually in evolution and transformation. So the, uh, the perception has to work with this fluidity. And that is good, because to stop our cultural transformation for a human being uh, means a suicide or psychosis, because you lose awareness, but uh, you cannot lose transformation, because uh, even if we commit suicide, uh, the body continues to transform itself, uh, talking about death. So this idea that identity is something static, uh, objectivizing, uh, even the word, uh, we, we say it is not an identity, but it is a tradition. That's worse, because our tradition identifies a transportation, a dynamic delivery. So the problem is how to be on this uh, moving boot instead of imagining it, it in a static way, because it is clear that even in terms of uh, mental uh, imagination, we imagine uh, we as uh, equal to ourselves, but we are not. We live because we transform ourselves. Uh, so maybe, uh, even in my courses of in, in, uh, intercultural courses, uh, my, my way to move from in, uh, too much intercultural is to deepen uh, in a serious uh, way, in an interactive way, intercultural that we are, because each of us is already intercultural. We are you know, we have different uh, cultural traditions uh, within us, and we have uh, to take stock of them. So the idea of uh, going uh, towards others uh, for in, in view of interculture uh, scares us. Uh, if you sit on your chair, and I want to take away your chair, but if I tell you you're not sitting anywhere, you're walking, other people are walking with you, <coughs> and walking make us alive, so if you fall, someone needs uh, to uh, hold you. So if you have a dynamic idea of the cultural identity, and especially an intercultural idea of our culture, I, I, am, uh, I, I am not saying I'm Roman, Catholic, I'm a man, etc., but I am from Rome, what, what, and so on. I'm Italian, so Italian of what kind? of what tradition of the rural part, of the urban part, or did you travel the world? I traveled the same, not the same as before. I lived in Latin America. I saw some subjects that changed my brain. I have friends, I have conflicts. So that person is transforming. So getting in touch with this process, intercultural process within ourselves can uh, give us more peace uh, and we can say okay this is a process let's give us a hand because uh, this is behind uh, what is behind all this so interculture has two possible ways uh, either it is a process that is managed in a, uh, with awareness uh, it is competent uh, with all the attentions uh, that are needed uh, and it is participative participatory so nobody has to receive it for others or, or, and uh, that is very easy, it can be managed uh, in, uh, unawaringly, uh, and it is in gray, so I'm uh, full of culture, but I pretend I'm not. Incompetence, uh, incompetent, uh, so I think, uh, okay, you come as a professor uh, of Washington, you come as a Sicilian sisters, uh, and you bring along pistache, and uh, that's it. 
but uh, these connected to relations of power, strength, hegemonics, uh, or cultural domination. So this is a contaminated culture based on hegemonics. Uh, we are all uh, contaminated by those who are stronger, those who can say for four years, keep this malaise within you and uh, keep up with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Pandolfi. Indeed, thank you for the passion with which you have uh, uh, given us your contribution. It could not have been otherwise, actually, uh, considering the fact that you have organized, planned all this, and you have been very determined. I would say, if you all agree, we, we have about 15 minutes left. So I would like to ask our panelists to uh, stick around. And uh, I would like to ask the audience, uh, both in person and remotely, if they have any questions, not only regarding uh, this session's uh, presentation, but also the presentations that were uh, delivered uh, earlier this morning that have focused more specifically on uh, competency in interpreting the statistical data. Well, I would uh, urge you to s remain seated and perhaps uh, if you have a question, I imagine there will be someone who will bring you a mic. <laughs> so we have looked also at the chat box, but there's no questions and only uh, Words of praise, apparently. So, show of hands, if uh, anyone would like to ask uh, any question or make a comment. Maybe everybody's exhausted. It is true that lunch will be served soon, all right? So maybe that would be, that could be an incultural experience. No, there is no intercultural food because Italian food is the best, period. Yes. Well, actually, uh, these sessions should include a debate uh, with uh, fellow professors and students. And actually, I engaged in a few uh, discussions uh, with uh, other professors and students. So there are imperialism, cultural imperialism, and uniformity uh, that we uh, tend towards when we talk about multiculturality, interculturality. Luca, in his conclusions, underscored the possibility. And this happened also yesterday in the afternoon when you said that the big fish integrates the small fish by eating the small fish, basically. So if the speakers would like to uh, be so kind to also uh, say something about uniformity uh, that should respect uh, uh, diversity of identity. I was wondering if you would like to say something about this, because I see that this has not been mentioned, I don't know, maybe at philosophical and sociological uh, and also pastoral care level. Maybe this aspect is not uh, really considered enough, I believe. I will reply very quickly. I think that there are two levels here. One thing is the awareness of the proposal, and the other thing is the proposal itself. I have no problem if in a specialization or in a specialized, let's say, study, there is a contextual, let's say, assumption or proposal, and that, that's it, right? So we want to focus on, in your case, philosophies of, uh, of this, from the Islamic world or um, from the Middle East or from South America. So, okay, this is what we, this is our offering, right? It's like, but this should happen when you specialize. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I really do not agree when uh, the uh, monocratic attitude of a specific approach or school of thought is uh, uh, then uh, offered to the base, quote unquote, without uh, the concurrent uh, intercultural uh, presence of other approaches, knowing that that approach is enriched by other approaches. So I have no problem 
if the specialization happens, but I don't like this happening when we're talking about basic education or basic formation. And we, in that stage, we have to help people understand that uh, in, we are in a multicultural world, maybe because people are scared or maybe because people are not accustomed to dealing with diversity. And so it's, uh, you know, uh, it's just better to uh, have a game of the uh, smoke and mirrors where we're all the same and we all look at the same reflection. Who knows? But I mean, in our schools of thought, we have uh, synthesized the qualitative and quantitative approach. Others say, oh, no. Uh, if you talk about qualitative uh, stuff, they say, ah, oh, you're, you're just talking about nothing, right? We look at facts and instead qualitative people, you're just looking at figures and uh, you're not dealing with, actually, we're talking about real life. So this kind of monoculture or mono approach uh, is quite widespread. And the studies on intercultural uh, competencies are, are, are there to see how people react to fear, if they close up or not. I was struck by what Professor Ottone was saying, when we analyzed uh, the uh, critical incidents, they said, oh, uh, the, the other person made a mistake. Uh, the other person did not understand me. OK, the, it's typical. Someone says, oh, blames the other one, right? It's, uh, the incident was because uh, the other one failed, not me. And now in 2021, in a multicultural uh, context, uh, I mean, I would understand this in closed context, but in multicultural context, I do not understand how anyone cannot see itself as being in a contextual situation. Uh, you might be delusional. I'm sorry if I'm using this term. You're delusional and arrogant if you think that what I'm thinking is the, the thought with the capital T. And not to confuse the four me's, uh, I, I, I don't tell them this is one form of thought that has its richness and everything, a beautiful contribution for sure that's necessary uh, to look at, looking at the world context, but it's one contribution out of many. And uh, I believe that Veritatis Gaudium, exactly, tells us that this interdisciplinary approach, the Pope says transdisciplinary approach should help us to contaminate each other and transform each other. But Laudato Si, and I'm mentioning this because we are here now, Laudato Si states that uh, this, the structure uh, for the care of the common home comes from uh, the knowledge and contribution from everyone. Uh, everybody should work together because the home is a common home. It's not an ecology uh, that we as a Catholic Church, uh, you know, we give our contribution to others. And the last paragraphs basically are entrusted to a patriarch of a schismatic uh, church in the context of the Catholic Church and, and a Orthodox, uh, uh, right, uh, a cleric. Uh, well, you know also that integral ecology is a word by both that was actually isolated by the church. And he involved the experts in economic sciences, social sciences, and philosophy. And they should not draw us into their truth, but they have a contribution to give. Either we come out of the situation together or we all <laughs> won't come out of this together. So it's this uh, uh, disciplinary awareness that really is troubling to me from the epistemological standpoint. But from the practical standpoint, we have to talk about this. If we are afraid, if we are together and we talk about this, let's see how to enrich each other, how to find a way, how to find a system. In every, uh, perhaps, uh, school, there should be a, a part of other subjects that are being taught that interacts. Each uh, professor should also think about a greater contextual and linguistic and disciplinary openness, uh, understanding when you should focus more on this and when you should do this less. Uh, not being able to talk about this is disturbing to me. And uh, let's, the, the, let's let's human part of this experience, which actually describes a great fear. Professor Tedeschi. And then we have uh, okay. Professor up there. No, I'm sorry. I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for this research and the results that you have shared. A question uh, that I wanted to ask refers to the word contamination, because it seems to me that this is an important point that should be considered alongside interculturalism uh, that is experienced in an, un in an unconscious way, which I believe perhaps applies to uh, most of the situations we experience every day. The fact that we live together, even if we're different, it, that this is the real life we, we live every day. From the future results that will come out of your uh, research, will 
we have also a snapshot of uh, the results of this contamination because as community of consecrated life and also as an academic community, we are different, uh, right? Uh, we're different once we get out of this. We're different from when we first stepped into the system. So I would like to know whether we can have a framework coming out of this that you can share with us in the future. And then talking about resistance and the fear of becoming contaminated, uh, so defending our own, own identity. And this research, in a way, uh, comes from a context of globalization. Uh, and this, uh, perhaps, uh, who knows, something. this is a broader reflection that perhaps uh, we could engage in. Well, regarding contamination, I would like to make an example that does not answer your question, because we did not present these data. But while you were speaking, uh, this uh, example came to my mind. In the analysis that we carried out and that we did not present here, uh, dedicated to academic communities, uh, this refers to the second uh, focus group. Uh, regarding uh, formal activities of learning and teaching, let's focus on contents. Contents in the statements of participants can be differentiated between uh, European, let's say, uh, and also uh, from uh, uh, other origins, let's say. Contamination, the European matrix, let's say, contamination, shows a high number of uh, uh, situations in which we're told we would like to transfer this to our context. But on the other hand, it is difficult to transfer all this into our context. When instead we look at those who have spoken about context from other matrices in addition to the European matrix, it's interesting to see that the teachers and students say learned also uh, through uh, and from students. So here I can perceive a contamination because several uh, professors talk about this contamination. Uh, they say that some contents that have been studied in depth by a student have also become part of their syllabus. Uh, but the red label instead that I see on the other side states that the, the Professors say, are saying that this requires a time, a critical skills, epistemological criteria that we need to rethink in a way. So this seems to me an example of this kind of contamination that you were referring to. I might add that the word contamination has three meanings. A biochemical uh, meaning that is used also uh, uh, right, uh, to po popularize this concept, like uh, drinking water that becomes undrinkable, breathable air that becomes unbreathable. So it's a problem of lack of human uh, access or accessibility, and so loss of humanity. In the context of social sciences, contamination identifies uh, something which is the essence itself of cultural processes, uh, so no one is pure. And biologically, stricto senso, each time, like the pharaohs in ancient Egypt who wanted to be pure because they were uh, the uh, children of God and they would intermarry, and we know that purity, genetically speaking, leads to disease and then death, right? So yesterday we were seeing that King David uh, married a, a Canaanite uh, woman, and they married according to the Canaanite style. So mankind exists and also makes progress to the extent that it contaminates itself rather than purifies itself. Uh, in cultural anthropology, a seminal book on this is uh, Pure Fruits uh, uh, Go Crazy. It's a, a US poem. I'm sorry if I mistranslated probably the, the title. So uh, this po poet says, if when cultures think that they're pure, either they are, are not understanding themselves and they are starting to cause damage to their own selves and others because they persecute themselves and others in the name of a purely theoretical purity. So the word contamination should be uh, cleansed of negative meanings. And we we have to recover the genetic and biological aspect and the cultural aspects that basically shows that contamination means vitality, enrichment, right? In the liturgy, and there too we have conservatives and traditionalists quite often, what is being pointed to something that's right is the fruit of contamination that we decided that we're happy with. Uh, other contaminations we don't like instead. The problem is not, not contamination per se, but the reason why some things we accept and others we don't. But it's not that the struggle against the syncretism or contamination, because it's a neurotic attitude. It's different when we, uh, in uh, based on participation, 
based on listening dialogue, when I decide uh, what parts I want to include and why, and which ones I, do want, I want to exclude and why. But if I do this against syncretism and against contamination, if you uh, introduce to me philosopher, anthropologist, liturgist, uh, theory, whatever theory, whatever right, whatever cultural process, that is not the fruit of at least four contaminations, uh, I will write a scientific article on this because I found something that's truly unique. Contamination is life, I believe. So. Uh, diffusing the sphere, right? In, in our research, as Professor Gauthier was saying, and rightly so, we're not saying what should be done. We will say, uh, what, what do people say about contamination in our research? We're not saying what comes out of contamination. We are saying what people say about this, what people, uh, the story that they tell, what they display, what they show. Uh, the points in the questionnaire that they have preferred, but not exactly what, what reality is. So this is something that we have to discuss together as formators and formies. Yes, one last comment, uh, uh, Professor. Grazie. Io vorrei contare solo una cosa mi sta succedendo in questi ultimi. I am from Mozambique as I said yesterday, and uh, Mozambique is uh, a country with a Muslim majority, but uh, the, because of the Portuguese uh, production, Catholicism is important. I was born in a totally Christian area, born and grown up without being interested very much in what is Eastern because I feel it uh, far from me. In the last few years, uh, you heard uh, all the media from Gaza, etc. Islamic, uh, radical Islamic terrorism was born. In this moment, the whole province of Mozambique is in an uh, ongoing war. Mozambique was occupied by terrorists, uh, as we saw in Syria, etc. And I was asked, uh, for intermediate uh, uh, religious dialogue. Uh, that was uh, quickly called intercultural, but the reason is that uh, beyond the conflicts uh, that seemed of religious origin, there were other claims, uh, territorial claims, uh, there were legal implications. Uh, in Europe, you pay taxes, and uh, with the money of the tax, uh, you can build uh, infrastructure for the whole population. The Islamic law makes that everyone had uh, their own poor, and I gave uh, to my poor what I wanted. Uh, and in doing so, I didn't give them a full citizenship because uh, they came on to depend on me. So it was not a religious issue, but more a legal issue concerning citizenship, etc. So I decided to call this uh, interreligious dialogue. But I, I tell you something very simple. A Muslim in a webinar discussed with a Catholic priest, and I was called to be a mediator in this discussion. So these two people could not talk to each other. Each one talked about their own belief, his own religion, etc. But they crossed to have a dialogue, but there were two monologues, actually. It was not a true dialogue. So I went to Pemba for a meeting. There was a Brazilian priest who risked his life uh, being there in Mozambique, Luis de Lisboa, maybe heard about him. And uh, there were 100 people in an interreligious dialogue, involved in an interreligious dialogue. And people did not know, know how to talk to each other. So I. Uh, I reasoned it was very hard to talk to Muslims because the level, basic level of education of people uh, lived much to desire. They didn't have a basic uh, culture that enabled to enter in dialogue. So in a discussion that priest that I knew very well, he was, uh, he studied here in Rome with the Franciscans at the Antoniano, 
So in the discussions we had, I realized something that uh, made me scared. That is, the priest with whom I was talking uh, was a professor. He was a doctor, but first of all, but he was not capable to dialogue. Second, it seemed he knew very little about what is really Christianity. He confused a little bit the Christian proposal of uh, the creed and the historical and cultural conditionings that Christianity suffered during the time, going from uh, Emperor Constantine to the evangelization of the Middle Age with Urban VIII, etc. So, who has been hiding the Christian proposal to us, like Peter and Paul, who cannot be separated. So, the unity of the doctrine and its universal nature. So, when I talked, I remained concerned that I started discussing with the students, the seminarians. So, I know something that I try to understand what they learn. What is Christianity for you? What is the, the Christian message? So, having heard about this uh, meeting, I had this question in mind. Because our discussion here of interculture is uh, done on the basis of uh, human science uh, with much uh, uh, perspective, uh, with much background, uh, see what Professor proposed. So, this discussion in uh, the constructive uh, critical terms uh, concerning our understanding of what is Christianity should be a proposal uh, that comes out of uh, uh, Mr. Uh, science and enter the issue of understanding of a Christianity in a circle of basic formation of theology, of the formation we give uh, to, with the studies of specialization in canon law, etc. <clears throat> I think we should transform what we're doing here based on the basic curriculum of these young people who are much more superstitious than Christian. They know many things. But they ask, what is, what is the proposal of Christianity? What do we bring that is different than uh, what Islam brings? And they will tell you many things. Uh, you will know the names of angels and saints. Uh, they know uh, stories. Uh, but uh, about the proposal of Christianity, they know very little. So this critical deconstruction, which means to introduce uh, this uh, intercultural speech uh, into a deeper formation of everything that a priest is, everything that a missionary is. Uh, I think uh, this is a basic uh, challenge. So I make the proposal to change the curriculum and introduce the more basic uh, formation. So Professor Severino, Thank you. And now we have a lunch break. I and uh, we'll meet here at uh, 3 p.m. to begin our afternoon session. Have a good lunch.